Good evening. I hereby call to order the action session of the Board of School Commissioners for Thursday, April 27th. The colors will be posted this evening by the color guard from George Washington Community High School, Cadet First Lieutenant Chase Dodson, Cadet C Command Sergeant Major Mark Benson, Cadet Sergeant Marquetta Marquita Eckerson, Cadet Corporal Jordan Tackett, Cadet Corporal Shelby Oliver, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Robert Sowers will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise for the presentation of colors. Thank you to the color guard from George Washington High School. Mr. Mulholland, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Arnold? Here. Commissioner Bentley? Here. Secretary Gore? Here. Commissioner Hoops? Here. Commissioner Moore? Here. Vice President O'Connor? President Sullivan? Here. Thank you, Mr. Mulholland. We will now adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. The agenda was reviewed on Tuesday and reflects any necessary modifications or additions. Reviewing the modified agenda, are there any requests for changes to the agenda as presented? Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I have a motion and a second. second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda is adopted. We will now proceed to section two. This evening's student performance comes to us from Edison School of the Arts, School 47. Edison School of the Arts, School 47 promotes high academic and creative achievement through the integration of visual and performing arts classes for students in grades K through six. Each year, Edison students perform an annual spring production. On May 23rd, 24th, and 25th, Edison students will present Willy Wonka Jr., the musical. This evening, we're in for a treat as members of the cast give us a sneak peek of segments from the musical. Performing Pure Imagination, I See It on TV, and Golden Ticket from Willy Wonka Jr. the Musical, please welcome students from Edison School of the Arts. I'm Juliana Martinez, and I play the role of Willy Wonka.
I'm Tejan Bohannon, and I'm playing the role of Charlie Bucket. I'm Derek Wilson. I play the role of Finnish Shout the TV director. I'm Eric Brooks, and I play Mike TV. My name is Aaliyah Barnett, and I play Miss TV. Here one more time for the performers from Edison School of the Arts. I think I'm going to keep thinking of that positive song. Um, we have two special recognitions to make this evening. Our first honoree this evening is Charlotte Ottinger Fleck. Charlotte is a parent volunteer and has spent many hours organizing and preserving historical documents and materials related to 150 years of Shortridge High School history. Charlotte's knowledge of Indianapolis history has helped our teachers connect in-class curriculum to off-campus resources, 
Charlotte continues to skillfully and passionately represent Shortridge High School when building partnerships, raising funds, and capturing the story of Shortridge High School. On behalf of the Indianapolis Public Schools Board of School Commissioners, I extend our sincerest appreciation to Charlotte Ottinger Flick for your dedication to supporting the Shortridge High School and the families we proudly serve. Charlotte, you wanna come on up? Thank you, Charlotte. Our next honoree, our next honorees are Taranza Brown and the Traders Point Church. Taranza Brown and Traders Point Church have led efforts to help support the student, faculty, and staff at James Whitcomb Riley School 43. Together, they have been instrumental in providing the backpacks and school supplies. They have collected dry goods for the in-school pantry, and church members continue to volunteer to work as classroom assistants and student mentors. On behalf of the Indianapolis Public Schools Board of School Commissioners, I extend our sincere appreciation to both Taranza Brown and Traders Point Church for your dedication to supporting James Whitcomb Riley and the families we proudly serve. Taranza here. Thank you. Now moving to section three of our agenda, does any commissioner wish to offer comments at this time? Thank you. We will now receive public comment from those individuals or groups who have signed up to offer comments to the board this evening. I will remind our speakers that you are allowed three minutes to offer comments to the board. The timer will start when you begin, and I ask that you briefly conclude your remarks when you hear the timer go off. Comments should be directed to the board collectively, should be respectful, and should not address a topic that might be of a confidential nature or that would compromise the impartiality of the board. I will also remind our speakers that while the board is happy to receive your comments, we will not respond or answer any questions. Please come to the podium and begin your comments when your name is called. Our first commenter this evening is Christy Carter, please. Good evening. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity to talk this evening. Um, some of you already know me. I am Christy Carter. I have worn many hats, past and present. I, am, uh, I live in IPS on the west side. I am a business person that employs both students, graduates, and teachers of IPS. I am very involved with the neighborhood and communities in, on the west side. I am a former employee of IPS, and I have two daughters that attend IPS. I'm here on behalf of my daughter and all the children on the west side that do not have a viable option for seventh grade. I have come to you with two concerns, transportation and the option for seventh grade. I have a daughter and like many of the children in IPS, attend a school that ends at sixth grade. Currently, she is targeted to attend Northwest High School in the fall, our current boundary school. I have been very happy with my daughter's education at this point. She is bilingual due to the Theater Potter School 74. She writes so well due to the training that these teachers have received. Many of the parents I have spoken with on the West Side are also very satisfied with their West Side schools. Even, even when the schools are very, have very large class sizes and the crowdedness of these, with the crowdedness of these schools, they are very happy. I know with my experience in IPS that sixth grade teachers work hard to get their students to apply to magnet programs due to some of the current middle school programs on the west side that will no longer be in existence and really lack a lot of the programming that we want. 
Like many of the students on the west side, we have applied for the magnet lottery program. We did not get our first choice, but was offered our second choice with great disappointment. Why? Because we were told that, we, that when, we were fir when we first entered our daughters into IPS's Spanish immersion program, that it would continue on to Harshman Middle School, as well as the string music program, and then go on to Tech High School. This has not occurred. Although I know that Har the Harshman teachers well, and some are the best teachers in IPS, the school are, is not offering these programs. But the, but the primary reason we have declined Harshman's option was the start time to the school. My oldest daughter, who attended Harshman, her pickup time last year was at 6.03 in the morning. We drove her, I drove her to school every day because I worked there. I do not work there any longer. Now, I am assuming that the earlier start time of this school would make me have to get my daughter to the bus stop around 5.45 in the morning. I care too much about my daughter's physical and mental health to do this, as well as my own. We gave up our seat, so hopefully another child with interest in Harshman's programs will benefit. Just think, with a huge population of students on the west side, Providing a strong middle school on the west side could also lead to providing a strong high school. So I leave you with this question, it's rhetorical. Where is my daughter and all the children on the west side going to attend seventh grade next year? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our second commenter this evening, if she has shown up, is Yolanda Graham Dotson. Doesn't nope. appear. Okay. Here. Um, then I believe we have a final special presentation to receive before we move to section four. Um, Ms. Stratman, would you please come forward and introduce your student? Good evening. My name is Christine Stratman, and I'm honored to be here this evening to present to you a group of solutionaries. Six months ago, this team of seventh graders attended a conference with other middle school teams from all around central Indiana, and they were charged with a task to imagine. Imagine solving a global problem. And for the past six months, they have worked through their lunch as a team to find a solution to the problem that they have identified. Two nights ago on Tuesday, they presented their findings along with the other middle school teams at Orchard School. And by the way, they were the only IPS school in attendance. And I can assure you, they nailed it. So tonight, I'm proud to present to you the Center for Inquiry School 84 Imagine Team. First, I would like to ask if we can pass out these folders or hand out. Hand dryers will blow you away. A presentation brought to you by the CFI 84 Imagine Group. Good evening. My name is Anna. My name is Henry DeRyck. I'm Jake Fun. I'm Lane Starr, I'm Avery Sellers. What is Imagine? Imagine Students for Global and Local Ant Action was launched in 2007 as a student-driven service learning program designed to engage middle school students in community problem solving. Imagine serves teams for four or more students and a teacher mentor from any middle school across central Indiana. Over 800 students from 45 different middle schools have participated in the program since its inception, and more have been impacted by the students' design projects. Every week, CFI 84 uses two packs of 12 paper towel rolls, each costing $30.86, adding up to a total of $61.72 a week on paper towels. There are 36 weeks in a school year, so we are spending roughly $2,221 and 92 cents on low quality paper towels every year. And you'd think that all of these paper towels would go to a recycling center because they're still useful, right? Nope, 
they end up going to the landfill where they take up space and don't fulfill their potential. But it's not just about where they end up. Paper towels are made of paper and paper comes from trees. Trees that provide oxygen and trees that are key to survival of some ecosystems and animals. When we cut down these trees, we are trading the homes of many animals for some towels that are only used once and then thrown away where they will never be used again. But what if there was something we could do to avoid the destruction of ecosystems while still getting students' hands nice and dry? What we want to do. We want to make the world a better place starting with our school. We want to persuade you to let us become a pilot school, maybe with some other schools, to install hand dryers and get rid of paper towels in the bathrooms. Here are some facts about paper towels. Paper towels create more waste that we have to dispose of. And the trash bags that we use to dispose of these paper towels produce even more waste because they're not biodegradable. Paper towels don't absorb too well, and they take longer to dry your hands. If we switch to hand dryers, students can get to class faster. Rob Gogan, the waste manager of Harvard University, said that paper towels account for 20 to 40 percent of the waste from an office building to a dorm. San Francisco University is becoming a pilot school for, hand for paper towels. They say, that, they say that it is very expensive and has a negative effect on their trash compactor rates. Saving more than the environment. Sure, hand dryers are good for the environment compared to paper towels, but in the end, it all comes down to money. We calculated how much the hand dryers cost compared to paper towels. Hand dryers start at um, $3,600 for the total cost and are slowly going up by the weeks, adding $24 per week for about what the cost of the electricity bill would be, um, $3 for each hand dryer. Like we said, two cases of 12 paper towels, each is $61.72. By week 90, the cost of the paper towels would be just over $200 less than the cost of the hand dryers. By week 96, we would be saving money with the total cost of the hand dryers and what we calculated to be the electricity bill. A long-term investment. Over the course of five years, the electricity bill, the the electricity bill of our, just our school would be $4,320. The total cost with the cost of the electricity bill and the cost of the hand dryers would be $7,920. If we were to use paper towels over the, those five years, it would cost around $11,109.60. Therefore, we would be saving $3,189.60. Now, of course, it'd be a bigger savings if we switched to hand dryers for the whole entire district. Of course, the amount of paper towels differ from school to school because of the amount of students and the size of the schools. But if we're using the calculations for our school, over the course of five years, the hand dryers with the electricity would be um, 538560 But if we were to use paper towels, the paper towels would cost $755,452.80, and there would be savings of um, 200,000 of $200, um, dollars. We understand that hand dryers will produce a loud sound, but paper towel dispensers produce the same obnoxious sound, and it's very disturbing to the surrounding classrooms. And it'll take about 22 months or 96 weeks until we can start saving money. An affordable option. The hand dryer we have chosen is the Accelerator XLBW. It costs $450 and dries hands in as little as 8 seconds. In conclusion, we believe that hand dryers would benefit our school in both environmental and economic ways. We hope you consider allowing us to become a pilot school. Thank you. Thank you. Great job to the students from School 84. We appreciate your passion for finding ways to save the district money and protect the environment. Having received opening comments from the board and the public, we will now proceed to the consent agenda. The items included on the consent agenda were reviewed at our agenda review session on Tuesday and reflect all necessary modifications. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. I will now turn the agenda over to Dr. Farabee for superintendent report. Good evening, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam President. We have five items in superintendent reports. The first item is 6.01. 
the presentation on a innovation network school proposal. Alicia Johnson, innovation officer, will facilitate the presentation and also introduce uh, presenters for this topic. Again, this is an opportunity uh, that has been uh, proposed to the district as a potential partnership and also tracks back to a innovation school fellowship uh, that the district has supported as well. With that, I'll turn to Ms. Johnson. Great, thank you, Dr. Farabee. Um, I'll ask Emma Heiza, who is the founder of Thrival Academy, and her primary partner, Chris Stockage, to come to the podium to present to Commissioner. All right, good evening, Dr. Farabee and the board. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Um, my name is Emma Heiza. I'm the executive director at Thrival World Academy. And I'm Chris Stockage. I'm the CEO and chairman of the board of Rustic Pathways. So as educators, we all know that the skills that our young people need to truly succeed in today's and tomorrow's global economy are the social emotional skills, these 21st century learning skills and the global competencies that build them into the leaders of our local, national, and at the global level as well. And so we see in schools across the country an impetus and a push to focus on those. We see from the federal level a push around social emotional learning and skills. Um, and we, we know now as educators this is something that is critical to our students' development. As a company, Rustic Pathways takes roughly 12,000 students from around the world to remote villages in developing countries every year to participate in service learning projects. And one of the main problems that we see is that our company, like the entire um, industry of student travel, like college study abroad programs, we see about 5% of students are African American and about 7% of students are Latino or come from Hispanic backgrounds. And beyond just the, the lack of racial diversity, there's significantly less financial diversity amongst the, the people that are able to take these types of trips. And so given this, this has inspired the birth of our organization, Thrival World Academies, which has partnered with Chris's organization, Rustic Pathways, um, in recognizing this lack of opportunity and this lack of equity and access to these types of educational experiences that truly build tomorrow's leaders. Um, we have built what is a one-year vision for an academy for a school that provides, uh, focuses on um, students from underserved communities, partners with school districts, and provides a credit-bearing opportunity for high school students to spend a year in a academically rigorous program that involves uh, three to four months of immersive study abroad. So our educational program model includes four core components. We have our advisory seminar where we're really building those interpersonal relationships, the social emotional skills, and the global competencies. We are partnered with um, Summit Public Schools and using their Summit Learning platform to deliver a competency-based um, personalized learning model um, to help build our students' self-directed learning skills and help make sure they're getting access to all the content that they need. All of this is designed and facilitated and supported by our um, credentialed instructors. We are also, um, through Summit, building out a, the project-based curriculum that our students engage in, which is linked to their experiential learning excursions, um, where they're out in the field engaged in immersive experiences that are tied to their curriculum. So for example, we have a group of students this year in, um, from Oakland that just spent about three months in, in Thailand and Laos. And through their environmental studies, um, or environmental science curriculum that they're doing for the year, they ended up spending, they were able to spend about three days in a homestay um, in an organic farming community. Um, so this is through our partnership with Rustic Pathways during our time in Thailand, um, and linking all of that into the curriculum that they're learning uh, for their environmental science curriculum. Um, and so we as Thrival are a new organization, but our ability to launch and grow and scale and our excitement to bring this work here to Indianapolis um, is because we are partnered with um, a significant number of partners that are leaders in the educational field, particularly in personalized learning and in student travel, which is where Rustic Pathways comes in. 
So we are a 33-year-old organization, um, and we have about 100 employees here, full-time employees in the United States. We have 175 employees that come from the communities where we operate, born and raised in the countries and communities. And um, we, we have full-time operations in 19 countries around the world. Um, in every single country, we have a registered company. We have offices. We have um, vehicles. We have cell phones. We have a, a very big infrastructure built up around the world. And we work with 3,000 different schools around the world um, specifically to facilitate this type of programming. Three of the, the main questions I would say pop up with a program model like this is first and foremost, you know, are these programs safe? Is it going to be safe for my son or daughter? As a company that's operated in this field for 33 years, I can, I can show you we've had an impeccable safety track record. It's the cornerstone of what we do as a company. Um, most of the employees that work for, for Rustic Pathways have sons and daughters. They travel with us. So we, we treat our students like we would treat our own children. And we have a, a four-tiered system. Um, of safety, we have a global, starts at a global safety level, working with the State Department and organizations like International SOS, as well as broad networks of organizations that work internationally. We have a country level of safety. We have a country director, born and raised in that country, that oversees the country, that works with our director of safety, uh, creating safety risk management protocols for the country and working with the internal network of safety providers within the country. Uh, then we have a program level of safety where all of our program leaders are wilderness first aid or wilderness first responder or wilderness EMT certified. Um, we have wilderness um, risk management plans for each of our programs that we put through the lens of the international SOS network. And then most importantly, uh, the fourth layer is working with parents and working with students and having an open dialogue about medical history, um, you know, social, emotional things that may have happened in the past to truly understand um, the, the school group that we're working with. Um, and the second big question that comes up is that this sounds like a trip abroad, this sounds like a gap year, how can we be assured that this is something that is truly integrated into the educational opportunities and is a rigorous and credit-bearing experience that is going to be a part of a student's high school um, educational experience. And so this is something that comes through first our partnerships with um, big Picture Learning and with Summit Public Schools and their Summit Learning platform. Um, and then in addition, our, our staff who are highly skilled curriculum developers and we also have folks on our board with expertise um, in curriculum development. And so what we have built out in our first site in Oakland is a very well aligned to their um, graduation standards and credit bearing for all of our students who are receiving their full year's worth of 11th grade um, rigorous academic credit. Um, in addition to getting them the credits that they need and their A through G requirements, which is the graduation standards in the state of California. The last question is, well, how much is this going to cost? And, you know, at the end of the day, dollars and cents do come into play. Um, we've developed a, uh, a model that we are proposing for the innovative school model where we would have 100 students. Um, we would have five teachers for that specific program and, and a head of school. And at that level, the overall cost of the program would be just under $13,000 per student. And then as we grow an individual school and as we grow uh, an international network of these schools, the, it, the top line administrative costs and a lot of the fixed costs of running the overall Thrive Award Academies get amortized over a greater number of students, um, thus decreasing the cost to probably just around $11,000 or under $11,000. So we are now at the end of April and just over a month out from wrapping up our very first pilot year in Oakland in partnership with Oakland Unified School District. So we have 11 11th graders, 11 juniors from Oakland Unified School District that are a part of our pilot year. You can see some of them in this photo here. Um, and we are working to collect the kind of final end of year data, but the outcomes that we're seeing to date are um, exciting and extraordinary and really aligned with what it is that we believe this model can do for um, students and for families and for the community. So we've seen growth in our students across their core like academic attainment um, and outcomes, but also seen a lot of growth in self-directed learning strategies because of the use of this competency-based um, learning platform seen growth in cognitive skills as measured by this rubric that's been developed by Summit in collaboration with Stanford, 
and growth in the social, emotional, and global competency outcomes that we know are really critical for leadership success and for success to and through college. Um, the other thing that we see that just sort of shows the engagement and excitement around the work is extraordinary attendance. This is much higher than, um, and this is even during the time in, um, in Oakland when they are showing up to our school site every day. Um, we see extraordinarily high attendance and all of our students are already very fired up about being advocates and recruiters and recommending this to their classmates and their peers. Um, and so we are here this evening because um, we are really excited about the potential opportunity to launch a new innovation network school in partnership with IPS, um, seeking to launch in the fall. Uh, we will be seeking to launch in the fall of 2018. And as Chris had mentioned, have a fully enrolled cohort of 100 students who will be 10th or 11th graders. And again, this is this one-year academy uh, credit-bearing educational model that includes around four months of immersion and study abroad. Um, we are particularly excited to be here in Indianapolis. We you know, started our first site in Oakland, California, and are very excited for Indianapolis to be our first expansion site. We see a tremendous leadership um, from Dr. Farabee and from the board around innovation and rethinking what a school really can and should look like, what are the opportunities that students and families in Indianapolis um, need and deserve in order to go out and be the local and national and global change makers that we want to build them into. Um, and we also feel very much aligned with and connected to both the strategic priorities and the kind of core beliefs and commitments of this district. So feel that it is a really exciting and ideal match for the model that we developed. Um, and in moving towards launch, um, I am a member of the current cohort of Innovation School Fellows, and um, we will be hiring within the coming months a founding school leader who will be a local um, school leader and will lead a lot of the community engagement and development work um, in the building of the school and um, move through the kind of hiring and recruitment and training process to get towards a launch in the fall of 2018. So one of the main questions we've had is just what we've learned from running the Oakland pilot. And I'd say there's a few key lessons there, but one of them was actually running the pilot program in Oakland before expanding the program. And so in addition to the innovation school, in an ideal world, we would have the opportunity to run a pilot here in Indianapolis starting in September of 2017. And with the, with the program that we've run in Oakland, we feel that about 70% of that will transfer very naturally and well into Indianapolis. But that other 30% is really looking at Indianapolis. It is a different location. There is a different community. There's a different way in which we will we'll probably work with the school and with the teachers and with you know, the state's academic standards. And so running a pilot program with just 20 students really allows us to fine tune the program so that when we launch, you know, if we launch, an innovation school with 100 students, we're not launching it at the 70th percentile, but that we're launching it at the 100th percentile and having a truly high quality experience for all the students involved. So thank you so much for the time and the attention, and we are um, excited and open to any questions. We tried to stay within eight minutes. It's not easy. <laughs> How do we do? <laughs> 12 minutes. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Moore. So can I get clarification? Are we talking about an opportunity to work with us in a pilot or to, are we talking about working with IPS as, as an innovation school? That's my first question. So this conversation here is to both kind of like articulate our hope and our vision towards the innovation school um, launching in the fall of 2018, but the specific kind of request and thing that we want to raise is around the opportunity for partnership in the in the near term for a 2017-18 pilot. The conversation about the innovation school and sort of like the contract and all of all of that would be um, at a later date. Okay, so we're we're talking about a one-year program, correct? So are we talking about a school or are we talking about developing a program that could be integrated into our schools that can help us be competitive globally? So this, this um, proposal for a pilot would be the, a one-year program that would be within, um, within a school. Within a school, but not a separate school, right? Because for the, for the pilot. Okay. And then after the pilot, you want to do what? The because whole, I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. what happens to our children. So if they come in in the 10th or 11th grade, 
then they, they'll move back out, I'll assume, to another school to complete the 11th or the 12th grade. So I'm just trying to understand the concept. Yeah, so at full scale, the model is as a one-year academy. And so if it is 10th grade, for example, mm -hmm. students would be at their home school site in 10th grade. They would enroll into Thrival as sort of like a um, like almost like a magnet opportunity or experience for their 10th grade year. And it's still a part of IPS, uh, because, okay. which is why we want to be um, an innovation network school. Um, but they would enroll into Thrival as their 10th grade year and then return to their home school site. And so a part of our programming and work is also to make sure that we are in communication with the home school sites. Um, this is what we've been doing in Oakland. Our kids come from four different high schools across um, Oakland Unified School District to make sure that everything kind of translates as far as the students' um, graduation requirements and needs. Yes. Commissioner Gore. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain grade point average that you would want your students to have? And at this time, have you selected a school here in the city that you would be operating from with the rival? Um, so we do not want this to be an like, elite opportunity or program that is based on GPA or something like that as a part of the selection. Um, the only sort of restriction or criteria related to that is that any students who may be, we, um, we aren't like a credit recovery program, so students who are in need of, of that during their, you know, if it is their 10th grade year, during their 10th grade year, that is something that might be difficult for them to access through our programming, but there wouldn't be a GPA requirement. Um, for enrollment, and then we are hoping to engage in conversations and hear recommendations from the district um, around which school would be a good um, pilot partner site for next year. Commissioner Arnold. How do you ensure uh, you get the right students that it's a good program for them? Do you ever have students that, or did you, that? went over and got extremely homesick or it just wasn't? How does that, how do you look for the right student that will be successful in the program? Yeah, so there's two important parts that are um, answers that I think it's a really important question. Um, the first is our enrollment process. It's not about showcasing your GPA or showcasing whether you can write the most like profound or flowery essay, um, what, we, what we built in Oakland and what we um, worked through there with the school district and with our students there was creating an enrollment process that requires the students and their supporters to really think through what does this experience mean. You're not just kind of signing up without thinking through it. You're actually deeply understanding, I'm going to be away for this period of time. What is that going to feel like? I'm going to go sit down with a mentor. I'm going to go sit down with a family member. I'm going to sit down with somebody at my home school and have a conversation with them about what that um, what that experience will be like. So it's the, the enrollment process helps us to select for students who really are committed to this opportunity and excited about it and kind of opt in repeatedly. Um, and then the second piece is we don't take off and take the students abroad right away. Um, because I think if we did that, you're absolutely right, within the first week, we'd have like half of them running for the airport um, because it would be such a jarring and difficult experience. The reason this is a year long um, program and opportunity is so um, that students get the time to both individually and as a group and with the staff build relationships, build communication practices, build self-reflection practices before we then even travel abroad as a group. Um, and so we didn't have any students. I mean, we, we certainly had homesickness, but no students that, um, that needed to go home. How many applied did you have a lot more applied than were that you were able to serve, and what was that elimination process to get to the ones who mm -hmm. uh, were able to participate? Um, not so. Not in this first year did we have more applied than we were able to serve. We had a couple students who either they or their family during the fall made the decision that they um, decided it wasn't the right thing for them, and we supported them in re-enrolling back into their um, into their home schools. This was even before we departed, but um, what we would have done had we had more students apply than we had seats for in Oakland is we were going to do a lottery by school. So we, we had four schools that we were working with, and we would have essentially um, done these sort of grouped lotteries at each school. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Hoops. 
Um, a question. So uh, Thailand was was the pilot country. Uh, it was is the expectation that it would be Thailand again? And if yes, what, why is Thailand the place? Given that uh, Rustic Pathways has 19 other countries are in too. Sure. We we um, is the is the partner operating the program. I mean, we're open to running it in all the 19 countries where we operate. In almost all of those countries, we have base house facilities and and plenty of infrastructure to do it. Um, we talked about how much, I mean, the, the downside of Thailand was how much it costs to get there. Uh, for the Oakland program, we avoided our closest destinations, which would be Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba, because some of the students were Spanish speakers. It was their first language. Some of them were not. And we wanted them all to start on the same footing. Um, uh, to be honest, you know, is the partner organization operating it, we're, we'd be very comfortable in running it in any of the 19 countries. It would, you know, it would depend on, you know, the, the wants and needs of the school district and, mm -hmm. and what rival academies is thinking. That, that's what I was wanting to understand, if that yeah. it was, is this program around Thailand and it would continue once uh, the program, you know, was successful here and, and intentionally expanded. Curious to know if, if, if other countries would be an option as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. No, they definitely will be, and we're excited to be able to grow and expand it to other to other countries. Particularly that being something that is an opportunity for us to partner with the school district to kind of think through that decision. Commissioner Gore. I know that the district is important, but what about the family? Mm -hmm. What part does the family play in yeah. this, and how is that? Thank you for that question. I, this, so our students from Oakland came home um, after being away for three months uh, just under two weeks ago. Um, and we had a big kind of welcome back and welcome home celebration at the beginning of this week. Um, and this was a huge journey for our families as well. And that, that extended out to include aunts and grandmas and siblings, like younger siblings, older siblings. Uh, and the design of the program was very intentional around that. We were running workshops and community sessions with our families all throughout the fall to help them get ready in like basic logistical, how do you help your student pack kind of a ways to what's it gonna feel like day one, week one, month one, um, and a week before they come back, how are you gonna be feeling and processing through this? And then we continued that while the students were away and set up kind of structured ways for the students to engage back home to their family. So our families went through a very similar kind of arced experience to what our students um, are going through as well, and that was very much by design. Um, the other thing that I would just add in is just as much as our students have become this very intimate and intense cohort that has had this profound shared experience together, um, the same is true for our families. And so we have um, parents from literally different sides of Oakland who um, don't speak the same language, um, you know, who are immigrants as of four years ago from Mexico and so still um, speak very little English. And, um, and parents from you know deep West Oakland, which is the primarily African American part of the city, sitting down together and through a translator talking through, as a parent, what does it feel like when your 16-year-old is kind of like growing and stretching and pushing on those wings? And how do you know as a parent when to let them fly, how far, and when to protect them and pull them back? And how difficult and painful is that experience and process of learning to kind of both love and protect your baby and sort of slowly support them in finding their own footing and wings. Um, and so that the family piece of it is hugely, hugely important to us, is like intentionally integrated into it and has produced some, some outcomes like the one I just described that were beyond what we even expected. Commissioner Moore. Just because the pilot is before us today, um, can you explain to me how the program will be operated through IPS? So is it similar, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. is it similar to something like we have with the magnet school so that this become a, I mean, for your pilot, that it is a magnet program that we're going to thrust in this first year to, to determine whether or not it's something that we want to continue with throughout 
as an innovation network project. I'm, I'm just trying to understand how this pilot relates to what we're doing now. Yeah, so if, if we were to pursue the pilot, we would have some process in which we would uh, allow students to apply to be selected to be a part of this mm -hmm. pilot and the students would have this experience in the 2017-18 school year. However, the innovation school would not exist until the fall of 2018. In the innovation network school model for the 2018-19 school year and beyond, this would be very similar to our other choice programs that are housed in high schools. Mm -hmm. So this program could be housed in any one of our high schools and then students would apply to participate and be selected. And if they are selected for that year, mm -hmm. they then become a part of this program that is within the high school. And then once that year is complete, they would then return back to either that current high school or their home high school that they were attending prior to that one year experience. So in 2017-18, which is what you're talking about today, mm -hmm. it would be housed within one of our schools? And then and the, in 2017-18, the, the, the school would not exist, only the pilot. Okay, so I'm sorry, so would the pilot be housed in one of our schools? So as they identify staff, the staff members could be housed in our school, but the school would not exist. So Emma, you may want to speak to mm -hmm. how the staff would communicate and coordinate the pilot experience prior to the existence of the Innovation Network School. Yeah, so the the vision for the, and the idea for the pilot and what we have done this past year in Oakland is the students who participate in the pilot are all um, formally enrolled in a district, like a currently operating district school, mm -hmm. and um, then designated as a part of this special kind of independent study um, or choice program. And the, pro and, and the program is operated out of a school out of Oakland? So the, that, this is our current programming in Oakland, and we would be looking right. to do something similar here, which would be selecting a high school to partner with for the pilot, and all of the students course. would be... That was my question. Okay, yes. enroll at that school. So you, you, would, you would select one of our schools to, in which to run the pilot program, mm -hmm. then, we would select, then the students would apply to be a part of this program, mm -hmm. and then we would determine those, and those children would be with you for, for that full year. Will mm -hmm. the, will the um, so how do you select the uh, instructors that are part of your program for this pilot? Are they part of our staffing or are they outside staffing? Um, so that is something that we would hope to talk through in more detail with okay. the district, but we um, we would want to do a combination of both, I think would be best for yeah. the students and for their just kind of continuity of experience if there were to be one staff from the pilot host school. Mm -hmm. And then we also would have, we'll have our founding school leader that we'll be bringing in that will be joining the um, innovation school fellowship um, and overseeing and managing the programming. And we would also bring in an additional educator that has both the, you know, the credential and the instructional expertise, but also okay. the kind of like global education experience as well. Commissioner <clears throat> Hoops. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, just the assessment? Because you discussed sort of growth and academic outcomes and so on. But um, give us an idea of how you uh, evaluate, assess, and, and how you uh, determine the growth. Mm -hmm. So for the academic outcomes, there's a couple of um, like evaluation tools that are used. Um, the reading and math or the NWEA MAP um, assessment, as well as the like state standardized tests that students take in 11th grade in, um, in the state of California. Um, and the school district in Oakland also uses the SMI and SRI reading and math. Um, and so those kind of hit the reading and math scores. Um, the cognitive skills rubric is something that's through Summit. Um, and the, they've built that in partnership with Stanford um, and created this rubric of all these non-academic but still, or non-content, but still cognitive academic skills that they believe are critical and sort of scaffolded them all the way from six up through 
12th grade. And so we use that rubric to evaluate the projects that our students are doing and to evaluate their growth along um, along the scale within those um, within that rubric. And then the global competency and social emotional is a tool that we've kind of compiled. This is something that doesn't have a lot of best practices or like truly validated, you know, like high school student surveys out in the field. Um, but based on what is out there around both social emotional outcomes and global competency outcomes, we've compiled something um, to evaluate our students both from like a self-report and an observational um, standpoint. And I'm happy to like share all of those tools with you. I wanted to understand the staffing a little bit more. You talked about mm -hmm. there's the component of the program. Uh, there's all the preceding months before uh, mm -hmm. the students head out to Thailand. So um, are, the, are the teachers that they are working with, for example, uh, in Oakland, did mm -hmm. they also go along with them to yeah. um, Thailand, or do you have a, a new group of people uh, there that they're working with? Yeah, no, they, they traveled with them. So we had two lead teacher co-directors um, who are also um, educators who are facilitating all of the programming locally in Oakland with some of the support from our pilot partner school um, leadership and staff as well. And then those teachers traveled with the student group. We then kind of added more staff through the partnership with Rustic Pathways once we arrived in Thailand, because at that point you can imagine there's much more kind of like management and support and oversight that's needed. And then um, again, our two kind of co-director teachers came back with the students and are now um, facilitating out the rest of the school year. So that continuity and those relationships are really important. So when would we expect to hear sort of, um, would it be the similar time frame? So about the same time this year, April-ish, mm -hmm. they will have come back from their trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you would report out the success. Because mm -hmm. I'm curious as to the timing for decision around whether we think that um, a larger, if the pilot was successful and we would want to proceed, what would be the timing? Or what would you envision the timing of that to be? Maybe Alicia would, um, Johns would know this, um, in terms of the innovation approval process mm -hmm. for 18, would the pilot be completed prior to that? Uh, we're not wedded to a certain timeline as it relates to Thrival, particularly in light of doing a pilot. I think we would probably want to wait till either near completion or um, at completion before, you know, um, agreeing upon that longer term relationship. And that would be okay. We'd be able to do that. Um, what that would do in terms of family and student engagement, however, uh, and getting those students for the next year it would put us a little bit behind in those students knowing this is going to be a viable option moving forward so that that rising class would know this is something I want to do for my junior year. Um, so we, we would have to think through the timing of, of how we are engaging students and families and them knowing for certain if this is something that would be available to them. So would they have to receive their charter prior to, they receive the charter prior to the innovation agreement, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So what is the timeline for mm -hmm. the charter approval? That would be, I believe, the fall cycle fall. is when you're applying. Fall cycle. The fall cycle, mm -hmm. yeah. Commissioner mm -hmm. Gore? Okay. Looking at the staff that you're looking for, the founding school leader, have we put out anything for that school leader yet? Mm -hmm. And do we know what requirements we're looking for? And where would that person be housed? Would they be housed here? And are they the ones that travel as well? With the students, or yeah, so that that search um, is happening both locally and nationally, and we have some you know candidates that are moving through the application process, both locally and nationally, that we are excited about. Um, that person would be your second question was would they be traveling with yes. the students the uh, whole time? Yeah, or they stay here and operate? The yeah, they would. They would. Um, spend some time with the students in Thailand, but not be there the entire time. That's where the two, kind of similar to what we've done this year in, um, in Oakland, the two lead instructional staff would be managing and supporting in addition to the team on the ground in Thailand. Um, and the school leader would spend some time there, but also some time here, given some of the responsibilities towards startup and launch. Because you're looking to hire them in May, is that correct? We're, yeah, we're looking to hire them within the next, um, within the next month. So you've been moving pretty progressively on this. 
Yeah, the po right. so the posting has been um, has been up, and we've been searching both locally and nationally and receiving applications. That's a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars that IPS is investing mm -hmm. in this. Is that going to be part of the funds that we pay the funding leader, or is that just to sustain the children, that, the students while they're away? Because mm -hmm. that doesn't seem like a lot of money when they're flying and having to stay four or five months. So, mm -hmm. and I know um, that there's another two fifty from your organization. So, is that enough? Yeah, so we would supplement, um, I can't, if I can go back, we would supplement the gap um, that would exist in the cost per pupil, and so that 100000 represents about $5,000 per student um, to support their educational experience for the year, and then Thrival will support and supplement the rest through our and philanthropic And I think that's partners. why I was asking about the parents, mm -hmm. so was there any being expected from the parents? No, other than families. Other than support and love and communication, no. Yeah, Commissioner Arnold. Uh, on the uh, financing, is it just a hundred thousand, or would uh, you receive the student allocation in addition to the hundred thousand dollars? The request and proposal for the pilot is just the hundred thousand, since the students would not be. We would would not have like a school site yet to receive student allocation um, in the future in the design of the innovation school, yes, but um, the 100000 would just be for the pilot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to thank Chris and Emma for the opportunity to go and directly observe the program in action. Mm -hmm. um, it was an amazing experience and I appreciate that very much. Um, your gracious hospitality was such an indication of um, the care that you give to the students as well. So um, very much appreciate that and know that our kids would be in really great hands. So thank you. Question for commissioners, given uh, the timeline that's been proposed to start the pilot potentially in September of 2017, it'd be helpful to ensure that there is com uh, consensus among commissioners for us to move forward in discussing the pilot should we go forward, we would need to ensure that we have ample time to plan for that process and identify the students accordingly and also provide the resources as described to ensure we have the $100,000 as well. So I'm highly, highly interested in our students having access to this amazing program. Um, I can't say enough good things about it. It's an opportunity for IPS kids that I could not stand to pass up. I, I am very, uh, I'm okay, is my mic off? Okay, I am, I'm okay with the pilot. I'm very much so interested in the experience of our children to determine whether I'm on the other side for the Innovation Network part of it though. Mm -hmm. I, and that was my uh, also similar um, sentiment that I'm interested in finding out how successful it's a good fit. I would expect it to be, uh, mm -hmm. provides a great opportunity to our students, but certainly want to come back and, and hear about um, how they did and, and uh, decide if that's an overall uh, fit for us to go at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. I think I'm really kind of waiting and wanting to hear what went on in Oakland and how that's worked and I think mm -hmm. of it as a great opportunity for our children but it's something that I want to feel a little bit more comfortable about. The program, mm -hmm. I think the opportunity is great. I just want to be sure that our children will be successful. Are you? Oh, I'm just trying to get fabulous. some consensus here. <laughs> I'm excited. No, I think yeah. it's uh, very exciting and a great opportunity that in most cases only affluent children <laughs> get to participate in and mm -hmm. very exciting that our children would be able to have that experience as well. Well, given those responses, we will proceed with further discussion around the pilot and then once we've had time to work through the logistics in detail, we will come back to commissioners and provide an update on the potential pilot for the 2017-18 school year. 
Thank you again. Thank you. So I guess one last Thank thing you. I would throw out um, in addition to our thanks is just uh, to extend if anyone does want to speak with any of the students, the mm -hmm. parents, or specifically the principals of mm -hmm. the schools where the kids came back from, on Tuesday night, one of the principals mentioned that having these students reintegrate in their schools has really lifted the school. And so I just I think those would be really valuable conversations. If you want to mm -hmm. dig deeper, we can you know hand over the whole list of students and parents and principals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. <clears throat> the next report is item 6.02, which includes several reports as part of our uh, reporting process for our Innovation Network Schools. We require a semi-annual and annual end of year report from our partners based on our agreements with those partners and our policies uh, associated with the implementation of our Innovation Network School. Alicia will introduce the schools that will be presenting this evening. This will close the round of our semi-annual reports. Again, this is an opportunity for our partners to provide an update of where they are the implementation of their models for the 2016-17 school year. Great. Thank you, Dr. Farabee. Um, our first partner presenting is Kip Indy Public Schools. Emily Polino serves as the executive director of Kip Indy Public Schools. Um, and Kip Indy Unite Elementary, as well as Kip Indy College Prep Middle School, are both in their second year as innovation charter schools. I'll turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Alicia. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Fairby. I really appreciate you having me here this evening to just share some quick updates about our schools um, and continue to be incredibly grateful for our partnership with you all. Um, so the first thing I wanted to share was just a brief enrollment update. I think the highlight here is our enrollment has remained fairly consistent throughout the year. You can see we're down a handful of students at each school, um, but generally enrollment has been consistent throughout the year. The other thing that I would highlight is that our re-enrollment for next year is at, sitting at about 90% right now for students who um, are eligible for grades that we have next year. So we're excited about that. That's higher than it's been in prior years. So we feel like that's strong progress and our parent satisfaction has been high. The next thing I wanted to highlight were just a couple of our academic goals. Obviously, we're in the middle of ISTEF like everyone else, so I'm not going to dig into that data yet, but we'll be excited to share it with you as soon as we have it. I'm going to share our mid-year um, map data, so we use NWEA map similar to many schools in the district and in the city. We set two sets of goals related to our map data, and this is based on the quartile performance that our students are in. So if our kids, for example, are performing in the bottom quartile, we're expecting that they're making more growth than our kids who are performing in the top quartile. So not only meeting the expected growth for the year, but actually hitting a tiered target, um, which for our bottom quartile kids is 2.2 times what is expected on MAP. And so it's really important to us that our students are catching up over time, so I just wanted to highlight that for you. I'm gonna share the growth numbers, um, which, Expected growth at different grade levels varies. So I'm also gonna share the numbers uh, compared to last year so you can see how we're trending um, compared to our growth last year. Um, so you can see the increases in numbers from beginning of year to end of year. Typically you see more growth at lower grade levels. So this is pretty standard. Um, these are our math numbers at mid-year. We take the assessment in December. Um, so. I, I'm not going to share the numbers, but our interim assessments and step assessment that we've taken since then are also trending positively. Um, and we'll be excited to share the end of year map data with you guys as soon as we have it, um, probably over the summer. In reading, we're seeing similar trends with increases in growth. And so I'm going to skip to how does this compare to how we're doing, how we did last year. And generally, we're pacing ahead. Um, so you can see in math, K through eight, Generally, our numbers are ahead of where they were last year. There's one, one grade level where we saw a decline. Um, in reading, it looks better. And the reason you see the NA in second grade is because we didn't operate second grade last year. So as many of you know, we were able to launch our elementary school in 2014 with 100 kindergartners. That founding class is now in second grade. And so we don't have comparable data for second grade. Well, the same will be true as we add third grade next year. So again, I think our excitement here is that our numbers are trending ahead of last year in most areas, particularly in reading. This is not surprising, um, and one of the highlights that I would share with you in terms of strength of the instructional model, I believe last year we shared the implementation of a new grade level curriculum across both of our schools in literacy. We have seen tremendous progress through this curriculum, and I think the exciting part is year two is better than year one. Um, 
the thing that I would pull out here is that we're seeing growth across all quartiles. In prior years, we oftentimes saw much more significant growth for our students who were in the bottom two quartiles. And what we're seeing with our new literacy curriculum is our students in the top quartile are also making really significant growth. And so we're excited about what that means and the level of rigor in our literacy classrooms. The other thing I wanted to share is that we adopted Eureka Math um, at both of our schools this year. Math was our second part of the curriculum change implementation through a multi-year process. Um, so excited to have that up and running at both of our schools. And again, the level of rigor in our classrooms has increased significantly. And then the last thing I wanted to add was around guided reading implementation intervention at our middle school. So if you were coming to visit our middle school, you would see every day, um, right after lunch, every grade level, uh, we've got about 100 kids split between two large labs with all of our teachers, school leaders, and assistant school leaders deployed. Uh, students are working on computers do, using ST math at their current level. Uh, and then you have teachers and leaders pulling small groups of students so we can intervene and accelerate. So we're, we've been really excited about that progress and the data that we're seeing coming out of that. A couple of things that we're excited to do even better as we head into next year is to continue to differentiate and provide even more small group support for our students. So at our middle school, I mentioned the one intervention block that we have right now. We will be adding an additional lit level literacy block for all of our kids beyond that. So we'll have over two hours of time where students are in small groups, which we're really excited about, um, what that means for our students. And at the elementary school, um, we're just digging in more around small group instruction for math. We run a blended rotational model, uh, but we're excited to uh, continue to improve our instruction for small groups around math. A couple of quick school highlights that I wanted to give, and I think the, the overarching message here is community. So this fall, we were able to launch our first community council which consists of a number of amazing neighborhood leaders who support our schools and have been able to help us problem solve, improve our results in a variety of areas and drive resources towards our school. One thing I would highlight, um, our partners at IUPUI now run a mentoring program for our girls in the eighth grade, which is directly coming out of a challenge we were having to support our, our young ladies. And it's been awesome. They're now doing a volunteer project with the Julian Center. And it's really helped to change the culture um, and, and make it even more positive at our school. So we're really excited about that. And the other thing that I wanted to highlight on this slide, and it's really a credit um, to IPS and the partnerships you all have formed, we were lucky to be selected as one of the sites for the kitchen community and are really, um, really looking forward to having that installed um, at the facility later this spring. So thank you for that. Um, it is uh, really exciting for our kids and our community more broadly. We were also able to partner with the Bloomington Orchard earlier this fall and with your support, able to plant 20 fruit trees on campus as well. And so we're just really excited about what this means for our kids and for our neighborhood. So thank you for letting me share a little bit about what's happening at KIPP, and I'm happy to take any questions. Commissioner Gore? Hi. Hi. Glad it's good to see you. Great. I, um, I think you explained what guided reading was. Yes, ma'am. That was one of the things that caught my eye, and yep. that's when everybody gets together and Yep, and so guided reading is a differentiated time where we're pulling kids in small groups. So if you were to come into one of our classrooms, you would see a teacher at a small, you know, kidney bean table with potentially five students reading a book at their level. And then if it were an elementary classroom, another teacher doing the exact same thing across the room, about eight kids on computers and another five or six kids um, working independently. And so the thing that we're excited about is we've been able to implement that at our middle school as well. So oftentimes, you know, in middle school models, you see just the one teacher traditional sort of at the grade level instruction. Right. We're intervening with our middle schoolers too, which is uh, driving results for our kids there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second presentation is from Enlace Academy. Uh, Kevin Kubaki serves as the executive director, and Leah Cruiser is the lower school principal, um, and they will be presenting. Enlace is also in its second year as an innovation charter school. Hello, commissioners. Dr. Farabee and our IPS cousins, thank you so much for inviting us back to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, I just actually want to do a quick introduction because uh, 
you remember me probably as the founding school leader of Enlace Academy, and I've done these presentations before, but since the school was so successful and you wanted us to partner again with Kandazi Academy, I have transitioned on to being the executive director of the Neighborhood Charter Network, um, which manages both schools. And so we have turned Enlace Academy into the very capable hands of Leah Cruiser, uh, who will be doing the presentation today. So I just wanted to make sure that we had kind of a, a good transition there. And I'm gonna turn it over to, Le to Leah. Thanks, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with an update on our enrollment. So we have maintained a steady enrollment this year of 365 students. Um, this shows how committed our families are to our school. Our families are bringing in their neighbors, their friends, and letting them know how great Enlace is. So that helps us maintain a consistent enrollment rate. Um, next, I want to talk about our academic goals. So last year, hopefully, as you know, that we were the fourth highest in the district for growth points on um, ISTEP, and that really shows how we hold our students to high expectations. Um, so looking at our first goal, that students will show one year's growth for each year that they are on grade level. And then our students that are behind grade level, we expect them to grow 1.5 years. So something I want to highlight here is that for our winter NWA data, um, about a little bit more than 50% of our kids in reading and in math were able to meet or exceed their winter goal, which shows us that they'll be on target for their 1.5 years growth in the spring. In addition to that, for our ELL students, we have them um, to grow 0.5 levels on WIDA each year. We just recently received that data, so we are working on diving into it and seeing where they are um, in relation to this goal. On this chart, it um, shows our NWA math RIT growth. Um, you'll see the beginning of the year and the mid-year for each grade level, and then you'll see the growth for each grade level in the last column. Something I want to highlight here is that we had six out of our seven classrooms at Enlace exceed their projected growth. This chart's very similar, just shows our reading data, um, and I want to highlight here that five out of our seven classrooms um, exceeded their projected growth on the reading assessment. One strength of our model is that, so as you all know, that we are a blended learning model. Um, our kids spend about 20 to 25 minutes um, a day during their reading block on a program called Lexia, which is an adaptive software that meets the students at their level. In the beginning of the year, we give a diagnostic test. And at that point, 68% of our students um, were scoring below grade level on the content. We currently have more than 70% of our students who are um, either on grade level or above grade level on their content. Um, so right now, we're currently working on building our um, social-emotional learning. So we know that in order to get our students on the path for college and career readiness, that we need to start, of our lung start at our younger grades with social-emotional learning. So just recently, we had our school counselor and behavior therapist start working with the zones of regulation curriculum, which teaches our students how to regulate their emotions to allow them to be successful in their academic setting. Um, so they're pulling small groups three times a week to implement this curriculum. Most of the students in this group, in these groups, are our lower elementary kids. In addition to that curriculum, we're working on, well, Kevin's working on researching a um, curriculum that um, can allow us to infuse mindfulness into our day-to-day, -day, and we hope to have some training for some staff members as well. The last thing I want to highlight, so you know, we have all this growth going on in our school. I shared with you the NWA, I-STEP growth points. The reason that that is happening is for our teachers. We have implemented the TAP evaluation system, which allows our teachers to receive weekly professional development on best practices that they are expected to implement in their classrooms. This allows for them to become effective teachers as well as, as increase our student achievement. So as we have started um, spring evaluations this year, we've noticed that our teachers have exceeded growth in many of the indicators on the TAP rubric, which ultimately impacts their academics in the classroom for their students. Any questions? Mr. Arnold? What percentage of your students are Latino? Are they all, because I know that was the premise of the school was helping new yeah. learners. We're at 74%. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Gore? 
Do you have any uh, special education students there? And if so, were their grades included in what you showed us? Yes, this data includes all of our students in our school. And are they um, students that are in, integrated with your other classes, or are they special? Um, so we have most of our students are integrated with their other classrooms. We have five kids that are in a um, self-contained classroom, but their data is also included in this information. Mm -hmm. So they're growing as well. Right. Correct. Commissioner Hoops? I just wanted to know a little bit more about your social emotional learning program. You, you, you cited a, a particular program that you so yeah, so that was one of those things. Um, when I was here last time presenting, um, and I know you weren't on the board yet, so one of the things that we'd identified as a growth area was um, looking at the, the trauma-informed classroom and, the, and looking at that as such a driver behind behaviors for our students, so how are we gonna proactively address that rather than reactively address it? And so we've been doing a lot of work on researching what are best practices with the social-emotional learning components. Um, so what we're looking at is kind of a continuum of learning, starting with um, a lot of mindfulness and yoga techniques in the, uh, in the primary grades, building on to more of a social-emotional learning um, curriculum where kids are interacting and, and um, learning how to do like positive conflict resolution and those sorts mm -hmm. of things, leading into if they have that strong foundation, how does it then, how has that set them up to be successful for college and career readiness. We haven't chosen any specific programs yet. That's actually what we're in the process of right now. And it's part of that major Lilly grant that was available that we're pursuing. Um, we're committed either way. Don't tell Lilly. But, um, but that would go a long way towards us being able to implement it faster and more effectively. And when do you expect to roll that out? At, you're in the research process now. Uh, we'd like to start some of it next year um, and have probably a three-year implementation plan for it. Uh, I, don't, I do not have a question, only a statement. And in that, the information that you provided us, the facts on the diagnosis, and then the growth of your students are very impressive. And so I wanted you to know that I am impressed with what I see if all of these tend to be a fact and that, you know, maybe we need to look at some of the things that you're doing and see if we can try to implement some of those things into some of our other schools also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lasse team. The third report is from Nicole Fama, who's the principal at George Fisher School 93. And so I'll ask Nicole to come up at this time. Um, George Fisher is in its first year as an innovation network school. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, letting me come and brag about our scholars tonight for just a minute. Um, school 93 is finishing up its first year as an innovation school. We are extremely pleased with the progress that we have seen so far. Um, and I will just give you a little bit of our information. The enrollment at the start of our school year for our first ADM count was 382 students. Um, at the time of making the PowerPoint, we were up to 421. I think now we're at 424, which puts us at over 40 more students. And um, just this school year alone, we've had a lot of special transfers as well as new move-ins um, first half of the year and very recently. So our enrollment continues to climb. Our academic goals um, for iRead, ISTEP, and math are listed above. Um, we made great gains last year and became an A school. And so I am very hopeful and confident that our scholars will make progress again um, since this presentation was actually created, I read scores have come out. And last year we were at a 63.4, the goal was 67. And at first count, we are at 81%. Um, after our second round of scholars will retake the test, I'm hoping that puts us above 90 and they factor in the students that we've only had for 162 days. So that's a lot of growth for us. We're extremely excited about that. This is the first year we've actually used an assessment called Star Reading and Star Math. We chose to implement this because Project Restore had its own curriculum, which made it difficult to compare to other schools as well as explain when you present to people who aren't familiar with Project Restore. So we um, use star math and star reading. And as you can see on the chart, we are seeing growth in um, all of the grades in three through six. We are extremely pleased. The difference in months is about two months worth of growth. So. 
for example, our fifth grade math students grew one year and two months from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So we've seen over a year's growth in just the first half of the year for fifth grade. Um, and our students have done really well with that testing. In addition to the testing they already take every day. The Project Restore model focuses on the teacher assessments and using the data to drive the instruction as we always have. Um, individual classrooms are rewarded for maintaining high levels of academic performance, attendance, um, and for growth from week to week. We are very big on growth, um, even more than proficiency, as we like to meet all scholars where they are when they come in and then track their growth. Um, in prior years, Project Restore only had curriculum for writing and math. This year we worked extremely hard um, and introduced our grammar, vocabulary, and cold reads, which I attribute a lot of the iRead growth to because those cold reads um, look exactly like what iRead looks like. So our students read a passage, answer questions, it's timed, and they do that once a week. So we feel like that really helps put us over the edge. We also have students keeping their own data this year, so they keep their own data folders. They're tracking their own progress, and that goes home to parents every week on a mini report card, so there are no surprises. Um, Again, this is just a breakdown of the skills taught and when we test during the week. And you can see that's where we break down our five core areas and every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, our kids do take an assessment in the morning. In 2015-16, we were rated in A school. And this year we were um, one of the schools that was granted the school improvement grant from the DOE. So we're extremely excited about some of the things we're gonna implement. Um, we are actually getting some extra help for our mental health with some of our scholars, gonna add some after school programs. This year we've already started incorporating tutoring, which we did not have before, and tutoring for kindergarten and first grade. So that is all new to us for the beginning of, since the beginning of this year. I'd be happy to take any questions. Commissioner Hoops, I might have, you mentioned that um, the classrooms and individual students are rewarded for maintaining high levels. So um, we like to have all students earn the chance at getting a reward and being recognized. So we do a lot of different things. Obviously we reward students for high achievement, um, honor roll, things like that. We also re reward students, we call the categories like the biggest movers. So I recognize if you have a 40%, technically yes, that's a failing grade, but if you get to a 52, you've grown 12 points and I wanna reward you for that to keep you going. So we reward for that. We also remove for things we call like steady Eddie, steady Betty, kids that are just solid students that continue to work hard. We also reward for behavior, effort. Um, we do some field trips and then just little things. We have um, a shopping cart that we push around that has you know, treats in it and things like that. So we try to reward our kids pretty frequently because we are asking so much of them with such a rigorous curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Our final uh, innovation school report is from Emma Donnan Elementary School. Eric Lewis serves as the Senior Vice President of Midwest Operations and Innovation for Charter Schools USA, and Michael Dunnigan is the principal at Emma Donnan Elementary School, who is in its second year as an innovation network school. It's an honor to greet you tonight and to present on behalf of the Emma Donnan Elementary School Bears. Uh, with us tonight again, uh, Mr. Michael Dunnigan with uh, the, the principal and uh, Ms. Jackie Sissel, our community engagement uh, director for CSUSA. Again, we're excited to be able to present and give you an update uh, this evening to the commissioners and the superintendent. Our enrollment uh, was last year at 195 and our Enrollment began this year at 238 with a slight increase uh, to mid this year. So we're excited about the increases and maintaining the enrollment processes that we've had with that. Our goal is to move to the school grade of a C this year. We had the growth domain of 64 points uh, this last year, identifying uh, areas of weakness is to be able to grow in our math and our lowest quartile in math as being an area to be able to identify as our greatest areas to target. Then with our NWA math, with our interim assessments, watching and seeing how our students are progressing with the interims this year, five of the seven grade levels uh, meeting the interim growth targets that we're looking for, still looking at a group of students that are uh, coming in and needing to make catch up growth, but we are excited about seeing the uh, representation of the uh, growth by the mid-year, again in reading looking at providing the interventions that uh, students need and looking at the interventions 
for particular grade levels uh, like third and fourth grade this year, not seeing the growth that we were looking to do. So we were able to provide intensive intervention prior to the breaks mid-year, being able to put our most qualified staff again to target the students that are in need of help, as well as uh, interventions such as uh, even adding staff with experienced teachers to be able to meet the needs of the third and fourth grade specifically to meet their growth targets. We were encouraged then by how our students were responding to that by looking at our Lexia growth uh, as well. Uh, looking at uh, school-wide, 9 to 10 percent of our students at or on grade level at the beginning of the year with our Alexia on grade level and moving to 52 percent at and above grade level as we were assessing interim uh, with Alexia going into uh, March. Uh, then as well, uh, seeing the iRead scores uh, coming out, uh, being able to meet our goal in uh, iRead uh, with achieving 65 uh, percent in uh, the iRead uh, this year as well. So we were thrilled to be able to see that as we were identifying students and meeting their needs and responding to the needs that they had identified throughout the year as well. Our strength for instructional model, looking at the small group instruction and the rigorous individualized instruction, looking at cooperative learning strategies, uh, engaging students in the uh, instruction during the day, as well as the, uh, the individualized instruction program, the uh, adaptive software and the blended model to be able to meet students at their uh, diagno diagnosed needs. Uh, the intensive amount of time uh, dedicated by Mr. Demigan and the staff so that students have the opportunity to be able to have their individualized needs met on a daily basis. Looking at our opportunities, we want to continue to see uh, growth in the uh, student level data tracking. Our students uh, participate in personalized learning plans, which they review with their teachers quarterly but then they have uh, interim growth data that they're looking at weekly with their participation in their instructional software, meeting their time on task with their Lexia or their number of lessons met for their Think Through Math or other uh, software that they are participating in, as well as continuing to grow. We, we are appreciating seeing the engagement through cooperative learning strategies, so continuing to grow with cooperative learning strategies such as Kagan Cooperative Learning training that we will continue to invest in, building those opportunities for them as well. Our school highlights as we continue to move through, uh, uh, thrilled to see that our fifth and sixth grade uh, students are increasing their reading rate uh, by 49 words so far this, uh, this year. Our fifth and sixth grade students moving from 4% at the beginning of the school year to 44% at reading the appropriate words per minute. Third through sixth grade students uh, are participating in their instructional software with an additional 12 hours average outside of school time to be able to participate in the instructional software, seeing the engagement and the opportunity for students to own their own learning, which is in no small part uh, due to the uh, great efforts that the principal and staff do in congratulating students and celebrating students' uh, efforts, not only in their participation and growth through MAP results, but also in uh, uh, updating students and uh, celebrating their participation weekly of meeting their time on task and the ability to be able to meet their reading and math software goals. Two-third of our K-4 students uh, completing on grade level uh, Lexia Core 5 uh, uh, lessons as well. So we're thrilled that we're seeing not just in the numbers of uh, the opportunity to meet the students' needs, but also students connecting with their own learning, uh, which doesn't just represent a few numbers moving up, but students really engaging and owning their own processes for that as well. So thank you for the opportunity and we're glad to entertain questions. Mr. Arnold. Uh, now the building itself shares the junior high and the elementary. Yes, ma'am. And they, they're run as two separate schools? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. My other question is, I remember when the school was going to start and and there was discussion about where the students would come from to come to the elementary. What percentage <coughs> matriculated there from other IPS schools and how many were new students that had not previously been in IPS? So last year when we were finishing out the year, um, when we were doing the count of about of the 193 students on our um, enrollment, we were looking at about 101 uh, students who had come from schools that they had reported from the year before as not being uh, IPS schools or kindergartners who had also come from outside the boundaries uh, of IPS. And we had uh, just around 90 students who had come uh, from other IPS schools. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gore. Again, are you also operating with special ed students at this time? Uh, and how many students do you have per classroom? The, That's two questions. Uh, absolutely. We're about at 21% uh, of our students are operating as uh, with IEPs and special education students and the numbers per class. So uh, it's across all um, seven of the grade levels. So K-6, we have special ed students across the board, uh, varying degrees of um, setting. So we have some students who are in a uh, self-contained setting for the whole day, um, all the way down to students who are in the inclusion setting. Um, and that varies throughout the grade levels, kind of uh, just based on the student, the individual IEPs. So we get students who come in who are at varying places as well throughout the school year. And so we've had to make some adjustments uh, with staffing and adding some staff throughout this year to meet those needs of those students as they've come on board. Thank you. So I could have asked other uh, schools this question as well, but you're um, coming up last here, so I'm going to ask you. We've heard a lot of numbers, a lot of data. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of your, your school culture that you're proud of, changes in school culture, maybe from last year to this, um, something other than test scores? Um, yeah, so uh, we were very excited because this year we um, also had a, a very large number of our staff returning and you could see also from the enrollment numbers we also had a, a big increase um, and that's been exciting for our team because we got to add on some new positions. So um, throughout the year we've continued to get new students and so we've continued to kind of add some new staff. So it's been very exciting to get um, some new people on board. We brought some teachers, um, some vet teachers from um, all over who've come in and moved into the area or who have uh, decided to join us. So we've had a lot of fun with the returning staff, getting some new people on board and building that team culture and, and us doing some fun activities together with also a team with the middle school. So we had, some, uh, we had a very fun, uh, intense volleyball tournament uh, between the two schools for team building within the staff. And then student-wise, it's, uh, it's been great. We have been building a mentorship program within the school for our struggling students. Um, a lot of our students have really begun to latch on to uh, different staff members because uh, for many of them, this is their first or their second year with us. So throughout the year, um, they've really begun to develop um, strong relationships. So now um, parents are coming in a lot more, visiting, um, talking to staff, and the students are becoming very vested in the school. And um, we recently had a couple students who unfortunately had to move out of state and their family was very saddened by the fact they had to go. That, that really means a lot to me. We've also had families who've had to move and they've worked really hard to ensure they stay within the busing area for our school so that they can make sure their students could stay. And as we know, the mobility rate on the south side of Indianapolis is very high. And so for those families to be um, working with us and talking with us as they're looking for new housing to ensure that they're staying within the bus zone so their kids can stay at our building when they've switched schools a lot, that says a lot. So we're very excited about that. And we're looking forward to see what we can keep doing as we keep them for um, more years to come. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again to all of our partners that have presented this evening. Again, commissioners, we have an opportunity to hear from all of our Innovation Network School partners, uh, preferably in one session sometime after the school year. Uh, has ended and again we have an opportunity to revisit their progress uh, and get additional data points and if there are specifics commissioners like we'll gather that information as well uh, prior to those presentations. The next item is 6.03 which is the update on our school quality review. Uh, this presentation will be led by Dr. Legrand and Alicia Johnson. Uh, we have been working aggressively to ensure that we enhance our framework for innovation restarts, but also how we identify schools that may be eligible for restart and our overall interventions and supports for schools that are in need of in improving their outcomes. So with that, I'll turn to Dr. Legrand and Alicia. Thank you, Dr. Fairby. Um, and so this will be just continued information about the school quality review process that we've spoken to you about uh, in prior months and sort of let you know where we are in our process up to now. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the objectives, um, the rationale for enhancing the framework, the values that we are using in our design process, the actual, a little bit more about the actual SQR and what will be 
a part of that and then summarize those items all for you. Um, so we'll update you on, on this process, um, give you some additional details around the work we've been doing thus far, and then also share some of the proposed timelines that we have regarding interventions. So the slide you've seen before, um, which is really just laying out the rationale of why we believe it's important to enhance um, the current, what we have as a restart framework, but really to build that out to be more than just about restart, but really about how we make decisions about school supports and school interventions um, across the district. And so a part of that is more clearly defining what we mean when we say a low performing school um, and not staying so narrowly focused on just that state um, letter grade. We believe that it's important to consider more than just that one uh, piece of data. Um, the second is that we have a, a variety of improvement strategies that we currently leverage, and so we want to make sure that we're being explicit um, about those strategies and about which schools are receiving those and, and why. Um, the third is that we also want to make sure that we have a more detailed and transparent timeline for our decision-making processes as it relates to any interventions or supports um, being given to schools. And then the fourth, we know that we are also in the design um, process with our school planning and performance framework. And so as we thought about how our um, school intervention processes need to work, we also are keeping in mind the development of that school planning and performance framework. And so these two things, the school quality review and the school planning and performance framework will be able to exist together in an alignment. So as we've been going through this process, there have been sort of four main values that we've kept um, at the center of our work. The first is that we want to make sure we have a process whereby decisions can be transparent as it relates to our schools. Um, the second is that we want to make sure we're consistent and yet not rigid. So we know that as we do a school quality review and we get the qualitative information, um, we want to make decisions that allow us to consider the specific context of the schools um, and not kind of try to put a one-size-fits-all solution on all schools because they're all different and require different things. Um, the third is that we want to make sure that as we think about schools and, and support strategies for them, that it encourages improvement of those schools and it feels like a support mechanism and not a punitive mechanism um, for our schools, our students, and our families. And then the fourth is that we would consider multiple measures. So to my earlier point, we know the state letter grade does not give us enough information or context about um, the variety of factors that go into how a school perform. And so it's really important that we're able to sort of dig down a couple of more levels to really truly understand the story behind the numbers we might be seeing as it relates to state assessment. So I will turn it over to Dr. LeGrant. For this slide, we wanted to put several things together. And this is a slide that I'll um, return to in a few more slides and you'll see in other support slides when we talk about supports of schools. So in this slide, at the very top, you see assessment results. And as you know, you've probably heard recently that the state of Indiana will be changing assessments. So we've kept that in mind, but we know there will always be assessments probably in grades three through 10. So assessment results are a given. The second step of this process um, shows where SQR fits in, so the school quality review. That is only for select schools. We'll talk more specifically about it. We'll even share the schools in a couple of slides as well as the timeline. The th next two steps and describe for you the supports that are provided to schools. And the universal supports are supports that are provided to all schools. Um, schools receive supports, for instance, in HR, human resource and staffing. They receive supports from the enrollment office with Patrick Harrell about their enrollment, whether they're a magnet school or choice school or not. They receive testing support from research accountability. And so universal supports are what all schools receive. The next level is specialized results. Supports. Those are supports that are provided if a principal were to raise their hand and say, you know, I reviewed my data, I would like additional support in this area. So for instance, we've had IRE scores, a principal can say, I've had my first round of IRE testing, I would like additional support on IRE. Or a school can say to Patrick Harrell in the enrollment office, I really want support in helping to brand my school to increase my enrollment, and that's specialized support. So principals can raise their hand and ask for that, or we can see trends and offer that support proactively to them. 
The next level deals with the IPS priority supports. We as a district identify priority schools under Dr. Farabee's tenure during his first year. So back then we had 22 schools that were labeled as an F and we identified schools to provide intensive support to those schools prior to other labels by the state of Indiana. And so they were called, we called them priority schools and those schools still exist now um, and receive those additional specialized, more intensive supports. The next level is transformation zone supports. You've heard about that recently. We recently, as a district, we, um, we submitted our application for the transformation zone with the state of Indiana. That's a state designation. They provide additional funds to those schools, um, and they also provide additional supports as well, and that's transformation zone. What you will see that's pretty unique and I think um, very helpful on this one slide as well is that by the schools with the, the green steps, universal supports and specialized supports, you see a door. That means an opportunity for innovation conversion. So schools like Edison Performing Arts School, um, Nathan does an amazing job of um, balancing the universal supports, but he's also aware of his needs and he will raise his hand to receive any specialized supports. But he is a school that decided to have an innovation conversion. The next door, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, talks about the potential innovation restart. So those are schools, and you see that's closer to the priority of transformation zone schools, but those are schools that themselves could raise their hands to say, I would like to restart, um, or we as a district, as we've done in the past, say we want to proactively uh, restart those schools. On this slide, we share with you how we identify the schools that will receive a school quality review. So we first looked at the bottom quartile of proficiency scores, the number of students who actually passed the actual ELA and math assessments, and so we looked at the bottom quartile. Now among those schools in the bottom quartile, we also looked at those that were the bottom half of growth. So there is performance, proficiency, I'm sorry, as well as growth. And you heard Nicole Farmer talk about their success with growth. You also heard in last they discuss growth. We've had schools that they, maybe their proficiency rate wasn't what they wanted it to be, but they showed great growth. And I think Nicole also gave an example of that. So maybe a 40% proficiency rate, but um, specifically for Fisher, they had the highest growth in our district. And so what we did is the bottom half of proficiency, but then and within that number, what are the schools that were the bottom half of growth? So once those schools are identified and we go visit, and in the next slide I'll show you the actual schools, this will give us a chance to look behind the numbers. So the state assessments provide the quantitative information, and we've always used that, but the school quality review will give us the qualitative pieces so that a school is more than just numbers. So we will do school walkthroughs, and we also will have interviews with different members of the stakeholder groups, so school leadership themselves, teachers, staff members, students, and as well as their families to talk about the school and how things are going in the school. Those visits will take place in August and September. So if you lay that back on top of this framework, which provides the steps of support in IPS, when we see the schools, um, and I think, when we actually go visit the schools, we will um, share with them um, what we suggest as next steps. So if some of the schools we visit will be um, priority schools, they could be. Schools we visit could be in the transformation zone. They could also be schools that have received universal or specialized supports. So once we visit those schools, we'll have conversations about next steps. And our approach is all as a matter of support. We want to provide support to them. So for instance, if you are in a school and right now you just receive universal supports, we might suggest to you, let's raise our hand to find some more specialized supports in your schools based on the data we've seen and also the actual quality things that we observe. If you are a priority school, we might intensify or provide a greater focus on the supports that you receive. Um, if you are a transformation zone school, the same thing is true. If you are a school and you already have specialized supports, you've raised your hand or we've proactively provided it, we might adjust those so that you have better success within your school. It all, as you can imagine, that there could be some opportunities that when we visit schools um, that have not been, not been successful or had some failure in the past, it could also be a conversation that we have with them about restarting as an innovation school. 
So in this one graphic, it just lays out for us the kinds of supports that do exist and how we can move from different levels of those supports so that we have greater opportunities and more success for students. So in terms of the timeline, um, we will name the schools that are eligible, and I am hoping there is a slide. Is that, there we go, okay. <laughs> the slides moved a little bit on us. Um, so we'll name the schools that are eligible for that SQR based on the lenses that Dr. Legrand laid out for you. Um, to this point, we have met with the school leadership teams, um, and they've spoken with their staff members regarding the SQR process and the fact that those schools are now eligible. Um, we'll work between now and September to engage with the larger school community via letters, um, home with report cards, open houses that'll be happening at the start of the year, as well as other school events as the year closes out, um, so that our families in larger community are informed that the SQRs will be happening. Um, at the very start of the school year in August and September, we'll actually complete those visits. And then in October, share the findings with the Board of School Commissioners, along with the recommendations um, for next steps with those schools. And so listed here are just the schools that will receive um, a school quality review in the 17-18 year, Emma Donnan Elementary, George Buck School 94, James Wickham Riley School 43, Lewis B. Russell School 48, Washington Irving School 14, William McKinley School 39, and Harshman Middle School. So as we think about um, enhancing our process, we know that it's really important that we think about more than just one factor as we think about how the quality of a school is defined and what makes a school successful. And so we're excited for the school quality review to give us an opportunity to do that deeper dive into what's happening in our schools. Um, we also know that we want to be as proactive as we can in determining the appropriate strategies um, to support schools and for schools to, as Dr. Legrand said, raise their hands and say, these are the supports I need so the district can be responsive to that. Um, and then also this will give us a regular and systematic way to identify schools that might be struggling and again, define what the um, appropriate next step should be and to do that early enough um, that we can engage community as we need as well as school leadership and teachers and staff. And so we'll take questions. Thank you, it sounds like you've got it laid out and that sounds really good to be able to give the school support. I just wanted to know who will conduct the reviews? Are they gonna be from within or from our IPS administrators? How does that work? That will be, um, as you can see, I think I, it was on the slide as well, that it'll be an internal team. So it'll be a district internal team that's cross-functional so that we can tap into expertise in different areas. Commissioner Hoops. So I wanna understand um, sort of the, the labeling of SQR. You're saying that some of these uh, and I'm not familiar with where um, any of those schools are currently receiving supports, but you showed the sort of the different steps. And so um, depending on the, the historical performance of the school, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that letter or that communication um, can be one a surprise or perhaps you've already had some discussions over over the last few years. I'm, I'm really uh, in my mind thinking about, uh, um, for example, um, so uh, I want to understand a little bit better um, what that SQR label means, and it, does, it, is it, does it mean something different depending on where, what your historical performance has been? Right, I think that's a great question, because I think we, the goal has been for the, the label to be neutral in and of itself. So this is saying, yes, you, you're triggered to get a school quality review based on the prior year's data, um, but that in and of itself isn't necessarily mean there's going to be a negative outcome. So we could get to the school, talk with families and teachers and leaders, look at the most recent data we see and say, actually, based on you know the current year's results, based on conversations we've had, we think the right thing to do is just continue to monitor progress and not change anything. Um, or it could be a situation if a school has historically been you know pretty low performing that we say, we've tried this suite of strategies and support and it's been a number of years and it has not yet been successful and so we might need to think about doing something differently. So the visit itself you know, has a neutral value. I think it's what's come out of it, um, the data we get from that visit that will then help us determine what decision to make next. 
The only thing I would add to that part is that we, um, for the schools that are priority and transformation zone schools, and I think for the schools overall, they know that we look at their data and provide supports accordingly. And so the school quality review, the way that I position it with all the principals is that it is a layer that's in addition to um, just the data. And so they get a chance to have more than just the numbers driving what we do in your building because we know schools are more than just assessment results. So in this list of things we've been doing um, for several years to support schools, we have an opportunity to now insert something that's more than just the numbers, so more than just what we receive from the state of Indiana. And that's the only different piece. So this piece is very neutral um, in itself, but it helps us to form a whole picture of a school. Mr. Hoops, sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm interested in learning uh, sort of about the communication, because I think I'm a parent and I think communication, uh, and again, given the specific situation of these school, your communication is going to be different. I imagine not only the message, but how you um, interact with families at school is different and have different um, connections and, and how they reach out and connect and engage with their parents. So um, tell me a little bit more about what that May, September time frame looks like. How does that look like? I know you've learned a lot from previous experiences and um, are always looking at opportunities to engage with the community and, and, and parents into those schools. Yeah, so I think there's a couple things. I think one in terms of just level of engagement is something that we want to make sure um, in this situation that we're tracking so that we can see like what's the level of engagement we're getting as we talk with parents about the process. Um, and then I think more importantly to me, um, it, it's positioning this as an invitation for parents who take part in that August and September focus group. So, you know, we'll be meeting with groups of parents to give and have more in-depth conversations about their experience in the school. And so in the spring, it's saying, your school is qualified to receive this, this review. Here is why. It's based on that one year of data. We need to have this visit to figure out what is going on beyond just those numbers. And so here's an opportunity for you to engage in a very active way and to share your experience at the school to help us determine what needs to be the next step. Um, so the spring is really about laying that groundwork, that framework, and extending the invitation, hopefully repeatedly, to families so that in August and September, when we're doing those visits, we have you know, pretty significant engagement from parents who are willing to come and give us their input. And will you have metrics to sort of assess, you know, because obviously not everyone can make meetings, but there's different ways to connect with families given their situation, and how will you evaluate you're reaching you know, a percentage of, of, of parents and getting the message out and giving them an opportunity to provide the feedback. That's essentially what you want, right? Absolutely. So I think that's in our, you know, as we do this spring engagement, kind of the next the learning, quite frankly, um, that we continue to do is how do we now more formally track those levels of engagement um, with the goal being to be able to set those appropriate metrics for the fall um, around who actually comes out and participates in the focus groups or completes a survey um, so that we can see, you know, what percentage of families are we actually basing decisions around. It needs to be more than just a handful. Um, so how do we do more meaningful communication and engagement? The only thing I would add to that is that I would also at those meetings welcome questions from parents about their schools. So sometimes they feel that the central office is far away, but we are there to answer any questions they have about the success or the supports um, proactively before anything else happens. So we're there as a resource as well for them. So I think along those same lines, so who owns the engagement piece? Is that through the innovation office or is that through um, Dr. Legrand, or, or is it depend on the situation? Who's doing that, or is it the school based, or how, how does how does that work? Do you have capacity to really do meaningful engagement um, in so many places? That's a lot of questions, sorry. So we both grabbed the mic, so I think that was my answer. We both own it. <laughs> so we own, we own those it. schools, we both own it. Um, and what I like to do when we do engagement is that we work collaboratively. We, of course, work out, work with PRD for having their supports because that's their area of expertise. But I see it as us both owning the those implementations. And then ultimately, there'll be a pro, you know, an individual project manager named for each of the processes at the schools who will make sure all the logistics in terms of communication and those things are actually completed. So. Um, the one piece that's not here but that we have created is a pretty robust school quality review sort of protocol guide that lays out who's carrying what responsibilities um, for each of those pieces. But ultimately, overall, yes, between the two teams, 
we'll make sure that engagement happens in a meaningful way. And the, fa sure. and the families will be aware of what's going on in May and September. So we're going to, because this is a brand, brand new program, a brand new system that you have in place, which I think is a good idea to keep the families informed so they know where, exactly where their schools are and what we're doing to assist schools so that, that they are not surprised if, in fact, we're doing a restart. So I guess my question is, is over. not that we don't have a whole lot of stuff that we are already doing, not that you guys have not already got your hands full, but are we going to make sure between now and May, September, that the community is aware of our new SQR process, you know, that we're going to be coming out, that they need to be aware that, and how to engage the family. So are we going to be doing that kind of stuff between that time and now or between May and September? Because I do think it's, it's important that our families and our community know exactly all the things that we are doing to show up our schools and if, our, and if in fact, they do need some assistance, what those assistance are, and if we need to do restart, what that means. So uh, are we going to do a bliss on this as we do with some of the other stuff? So what we, where our focus has been thus far is on those specific school communities. So, you know, engage with that principal and staff. We've talked about the community partners who play primary support roles in those schools also being aware um, and doing potentially a, even a community partner focus group as a part of the SQR um, because we know that's an important stakeholder group to engage. Um, so to answer your question briefly, I would say yes, um, but certainly still in that design process and we'll take feedback of commissioners think there's a a more extensive outreach beyond the school communities um, that are going to receive the SQR for us to do. Because other schools may eventually receive, right? So, I mean, this is a start. Correct. So everyone should know. I, I would think we want as many people to know so they can be ambassadors for any of our good programs, which I hope for all of them, but that they'll be able to at least be able to speak to it if someone asked them about it. So the Public Relations Division <laughs> will support um, Alicia and, and Dr. Legrand in the school specific communications and we'll also work with them to develop a district wide communications plan. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. yes, Commissioner Gore. So what we're saying now is that you have already conducted the meetings, with the school leadership and these schools have been are they're aware well, I guess they are. You got it up here. <laughs> you bought that. Yes, they are aware. <laughs> they're aware. It's not just finding that. They were aware before this meeting. They were aware before the meeting. Okay. But you have conducted your April crowd ready. Mm -hmm. I have another little kind of um, clarifying question. So uh, when you mentioned the 22 priority schools that were initially identified, is that a continuing lens that is applied or was that a one-time kind of um, pass through when you first arrived that you identified? Um, and if, have those schools moved off? Some of them have moved off priority because they've become restarts or something else, but kind of where are we at from that original 22? We can send you an updated list on where they are, the current state of those schools. So we believe that the SQR process will help us to transition fully to this level. We started out with those 22 Fs and we chose from them 11 priority schools. So we did the same thing. So the 22 Fs, but then the bottom performers, and so there were 11. Um, if, and we saw great growth the first year and the second year, but then the state assessment changed. So the ideal world, three to five years of support, you should be um, no longer needing support, but not three to five years of different assessments and a different accountability model. And so that some of those schools, as you mentioned, have been restarted. Some are still um, priority schools. And, and we feel that the schools in the community um, have appreci they've appreciate the support as we transition from a new assessment and a new accountability model. But we believe once we get um, through that current group of priority schools, the SQR model will be our focus going forward. And we'll be able to um, assign schools to support levels and give supports based on what we see. Kind of transitioning from that original system to a process. Yes. Okay. That has more than just data, just okay. more than just a number. Yeah. Commissioner Hoop. Um, I have some questions about the support. Uh, um, how do you go about, because uh, you were saying, you know, different levels, universal supports. Um, do principals in general know that um, what kinds of services that they could you know, raise their hand and ask for, like you were saying, maybe they want to market their school and get more uh, mm -hmm. enrollment as an example, also perhaps uh, I read scores and so mm -hmm. on. It's sort of, uh, does the central office market those various supports that um, 
principals can volunteer so they can kind of have a list of things that they know that they can reach out for? I think they do know. We try really hard. We have principal meetings the first Thursday of every month. And so we keep at top of mind um, things that are taking place around that time, upcoming events, so they have an understanding of who owns what area. So for instance, months ago, um, prior to the first IRE testing, we started talking about IRE at the beginning. And so they know that is the support for instruction is from Tammy Bowman's office. And so it will be her and also her instructional coaches who provide the professional development for principals. And and then also say we're available to also help your schools. And so when we started the testing, another opportunity is when we started testing, Dr. Christian Friend um, leads research evaluation and assessment. And so he's the one having meetings with principals about testing. He also sends out data reports so they know he's the one that they can reach out if they need help with data. So I think they do know. Um, we hope they do. The superintendent has pushed during his presentations to principals that we are here only to serve. Um, and I talk about ringing the bell. Um, I'd also share with principals that we think leaders should be, um, not just leaders who ignore um, circumstances or not just leaders who see problems in their schools, but you have to be, and we talk about this being a level three leader. You see the problems and you raise your hand and you find a solution um, so that you can make sure what happens in your building is what we expect as a district and what you really want for your students. So I hope they do know and I think they know, but um, let me know if someone tells you they don't know. <laughs> we'll be glad to help them with it. Also, to uh, the team has done a great job with identifying strengths among principals and allowing for peer support. So not only do they rely on central services, but also they rely on each other mm -hmm. as we all work together to improve student outcomes. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach, not only from central services, but learning with and among each other and then if there are external best practices that are out there also open to bringing those to the district as well. That's true. I'm sorry. I didn't shout out our lead principals. We have lead principals amongst all our principals who are there to support them. And then we also at the principals meetings have principals that lead sessions and they can choose which session they want to attend so they're able to identify other subject matter experts amongst their peers. And one thing I'll add related to that as a part of the SQR is that uh, school leaders who are receiving the SQR will be able to identify a principal, um, a peer principal who they would want to be a part of their team. Again, so this is seen as something that is here to help us figure out the best support. Um, and so principals will have that option to select who they like as a peer to be on the team with, with us. That's an excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is 6.04, uh, which is the update on implementation of Project Lead the Way. Uh, we had the fortune of having an investment from American Structure Point to support the expansion of implementation of Project Lead the Way, which is a STEM-based curriculum uh, that we are implementing across our elementary, middle grades, and high school uh, to advance student study of science, technology, engineering, and math. So with that, I'll turn to Ben Carter, who will provide an update on implementation and expansion. And Ben is our Director for Career and Technical Education. Okay, good evening. Uh, today I'd like to just provide a brief refresher on the Project, project Lead the Way program offerings and then provide you with uh, some of our progress year to date. So as Dr. Farabee said, um, Project Lead the Way offer students opportunities to and exposure to STEM-based uh, careers through problem-based projects. Um, they provide turnkey curriculum, and they also provide rigorous teacher training. Um, and then another keynote is that their national headquarters um, happens to be in Indianapolis, so they're a great partner to IPS. Um, at the elementary level, excuse me, at the elementary level, which is K through five, um, they offer 10, or four 10-hour modules per grade level. Um, and these can be implemented, uh, embedded within the class, or they can be a standalone special. And so we have schools kind of uh, choosing whichever model they feel uh, suits them best. Um, so the, the, um, the different units range from animated storytelling and robotics and automation um, to infection detection um, and, and different projects like that that students can participate in. Uh, at the middle school level, uh, six through eight, they have nine week courses. So students are in the courses for nine weeks. Um, and they're standalone courses, so the teachers do have to go to training for each of those courses. And then at the uh, high school level, um, we have three career pathways, 
computer science, engineering, and biomedical sciences. And these are year-long elective courses. So in each pathway, there's four elective courses that students can matriculate through. Um, and then in terms of context, again, American Structure Point last May announced that they were going to donate $250,000 for expansion of project, uh, project Lead the Way programming, specifically engineering and uh, computer science because they're a local uh, Indianapolis engineering firm. And then what we did was we presented at one of our monthly principals meetings to share the program offerings to our principals, and then they were provided with a medium um, enabled, enabling them to opt in if it was a program that they wanted to bring to their school. From there, what we did was uh, we kind of did um, a check to see their readiness level in terms of technology um, and other pieces there, um, and that way we could kind of um, split the funding accordingly um, and making sure that uh, the, the funding was split in an equitable manner. Um, that summer, we had cohort one trained, and then this year we had cohort one implementing, and then this summer we have cohort two uh, training, and then we'll have another uh, cohort three uh, the following summer training. So what does that look like? So this year we had new, uh, 11 new Project Lead the Way schools, and then three were able to expand their offerings, so we had 14 schools. Um, and there's the breakdown of the different programs that we have this year, so eight uh, in elementary, four middle school, and two high school um, pathways. Um, and then we actually had 33 teachers trained um, this year alone. So what does that equate to? So last year, approximately 400 total students participating in uh, Project Lead the Way, and this year we have a growth of about 1,400 students um, with, the, with access to the program. Um, and you see that there's a lot more in launch, and that's specifically because uh, the launch teacher training is a train-the-trainer model. So the idea is that teachers can go back um, once they're a lead teacher and train their uh, colleagues in order to so that they can implement in their classes. So we've seen a lot of that going on um, at the elementary level, which you see a, a much larger uh, number there. Instead of the high school and the middle school, they have to go to an individual training per course that they implement at their school. So here are the schools uh, from this year. You see the list of the eight launch schools, and these were school leaders that opted in, um, and then they were first to kind of jump on board. And so we worked with those schools at Arsenal Tech in Northwest. So at Arsenal Tech, we offered the engineering pathway and the biomedical sciences pathway. And then at Northwest this year, we're offering the uh, computer science project lead the way pathway. All of the uh, gateway schools are currently implementing the design and modeling um, nine week course, which a lot of them are stretching out over a semester. Um, but really what that does is it gives them a lot of exposure to design thinking um, and the problem based uh, thinking that uh, sets them up for success in the Project of the Way pathways at the high school level. Um, but they do robotics, they do some medical work, and then they also do some computer science. So they get exposure to all three of those pathways in that baseline course. So for next year, we're actually adding five gateway schools, which is really exciting. So the four CFIs and our new Longfellow uh, Medical and STEM Magnet will be offering at the middle school level. And then we'll be adding a couple high school um, pathways at Short Ridge Engineering and then Christmas Attics uh, Biomedical Sciences uh, will be implemented in the fall of next school year. So that will bring our total to 21. And uh, I think that will be the most uh, schools implementing Project Lead, Lead the Way in any district uh, in the state. So we're very pleased with our partnership with Project Lead the Way and also the generous donation from American Structure Point. And the thing about American Structure Point's donation, just to add a little more context, it's a three year. So we're receiving the money. Um, over the course of three years. Any questions? Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Ben. The last superintendent report is our quarterly finance update. Uh, we've completed the third fiscal quarter for the 2016-2017 school year. As you recall, we are on a, a school year budgeting cycle. And again, this concludes the, the third quarter and uh, Chief Financial Manager Weston Young will provide an update, an analysis of current revenue against our projected revenue and also uh, current expenses against our projected expenses. We also have an opportunity to hear from a principal as well uh, at implementation of uh, strategic priorities in the school. So with that, I'll turn it over to Weston Young. Thank you, Dr. Faraby. Good evening, commissioners. Just want to say I enjoy being a part of IPS. This is an ex these are exciting nights because there's so much great stuff happening in our schools. And this is just a small part of it. These are the dollars that do all these great things. 
and great investments in our schools. So um, highlight the, the state funds and the property tax funds that we've talked about the last quarter here through the budget development process. More detailed reports are in the appendix uh, provided in the, in the, uh, the deck. The uh, supplier diversity, I uh, want to highlight that. Quarter uh, for year over year, we've increased our supplier diversity spend uh, at 12% of our total expenditure. Total eligible expenditures, our uh, eligible expenditures last year uh, yielded 10%. So we're increasing our, our focus on that and, and it's paying off in, in, our, in our metrics. I want to highlight that there's a lot of this great configuration process going on and a lot of the capital projects funds are providing those opportunities and I highlight that with Scott's leadership. In the 15-16 budget year, we, we allocated uh, resources out to, uh, or sorry, on the 15-16 year, we will be uh, having a similar process in the coming month of May. Uh, the, the slide be, behind this deck is a timeline of our additional appropriations requests that we'll be making. Uh, this is a similar process of last year where uh, it's a process to seek legal approval to spend money above current board and DLGF uh, approved appropriations. Uh, at the public hearing, we'll review budget amounts already approved by the FPS board for the 2016-17 school year. We'll also review the appropriated amounts already approved by DLGF for that same school year and any differences in those amounts. The reason for the, the request, uh, and specifically in the general fund, is that uh, beginning in the school year 15-16 budget cycle, uh, IPS made a tactical shift to budget more tight and more aligned with the uh, DLGF appropriated amount. Uh, this was a st st strategic shift in budget transparency for the district. Uh, so for this school year, the projected expenditures are expected to exceed the original pro approved appropriation, and that's why we will make that request. In the property tax funds, uh, DLGF does not approve their entire original appropriation for fiscal year entities. We are one of two schools in the state that is a fiscal year entity, and so it is just a customary routine procedure we must do to get all the dollars in the approval to spend. So. Uh, for 15, 16, or for 16, 17, we expect to request additional appropriations for the transportation, bus replacement fund, and potentially the rainy day fund. For 17, 18, we reviewed the budget the last, this last quarter as a team, but in January, just to remind, we, we distributed allocations out to the schools through our student-based allocation method. In February and March, we had the budget development meetings, uh, you know, number of them with you and, and the public. Uh, we, we have worked with schools and central office team to align uh, budgets with strategic uh, priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, all that happened without a legislative session that had been completed. So earlier this month, legislative session completed. I just wanna highlight some of the key financial items that came out of that legislative session and how it impacts us. So IPS on our pu per pupil funding at the state level basically remained flat going into next year and the, and the year after. Uh, it's still below the, the amount that we received two years ago. Uh, however, our focus on EL and SPED was uh, um, aligned with the budget uh, passed by, or passed by both, both houses, where EL funding is increasing and also SPED has had a modest increase in the most severe exceptionality. You know, we appreciate the budget bills focus on these key areas of need in our district. Uh, it's not enough revenue though uh, that is expected to be received to close the funding gap that we've discussed uh, and shared in these budget development meetings. Uh, at the federal level, we're also actively engaged uh, with national partners to address any proposed cuts in the federal education budget related to title fund. When it comes to long-term budget planning, uh, IPS is committed to its 2015 strategic plan uh, to address goals aligned with community input IPS has self-funded this, this plan uh, up until this point. In the current local, state, and federal education funding climate, fiscal pressures loom large on the horizon and requires IPS to be even more diligent in seeking additional funding to acquire and maintain adequate resources to foster safe, caring, and innovative learning environments for some of the highest need students in the state. Regardless of how much funding is available, IPS remains committed to focusing on how well funds are utilized. This commitment plays out through our student-based allocation initiative. This is a 
a repeat slide of the, of the deck in January where we're highlighting the move towards equity, which is one of the three key, key areas of our SBA allocation, where we distribute resources based on need. In this slide, we're, we're showing that we, we are projected to increase equity within the district from this year's budget to next year's budget. Related to transparency, IPS has collaborated with more budget stakeholders in the development process and outlined how school-based funds are distributed. And related to flexibility, IPS is expecting more strategic use of resources to meet student needs and increase student outcomes when school leadership teams are provided more autonomy to make those decisions. Next, I'll have Christine Rembert, principal at Francis W. Parker. She'll share how SBA's flexibility these past few months have allowed her school leadership team to develop a plan to address student needs in a bold new way in the coming school year. Christine? Thanks for asking me to join you in this presentation, Weston. It's been an exciting year to uh, participate in the autonomy process, um, which has really deepened our connection um, with folks downtown and uh, strengthened our connection across the Montessori uh, schools. You can see um, from the slide that our collaborative planning has been really powerful for us. We have now an instructional leadership team um, that is looking at integrity across uh, the Montessori model and our uh, professional development process and plan strengthens um, our Montessori brand to make sure that we're delivering the same high quality instruction across the three schools. When um, that's provided uh, more opportunities for Mark and Kathy and I to collaborate, not just as principals, we were doing that already, um, but to pull our whole leadership teams together and to really uh, hear from the teachers in a very strategic way. At my school particularly, um, we have come to become aware through this process that the social and emotional learning needs of our students are great. Um, we have a large number of students who suffer from trauma and loss. Um, we have Midtown support in our building. Um, we have kaleidoscope support from the district. Um, we have special education support, but it's just not enough to meet the needs of all of our learners. Uh, we've learned through the vertical articulation process uh, in our building that um, many of our teachers in our older grades um, thought that uh, the grace and courtesy part of Montessori teaching was really happening at pre-KK and one, two, three um, only. And that the four, five, six team thought that they just, the kids already knew it. Um, so it's been fascinating to see uh, people realize that it's everyone's responsibility and social and emotional learning are, it, we're working on some curriculum to deepen and strengthen that. And that's been um, a part of, of this process. Um, we've also, um, got an invitation to participate in AVID. That was something that was um, provided to all schools. Um, I love the AVID program. I have taught the elective before. My children are in the AVID elective in Washington Township. And um, it is a program that will provide some excellent, uh, both social and emotional learning, but also um, organization skills for our students in middle school. And we're very excited about that and the support from uh, Tammy Bowman and Dr. Legrand for AVID. In terms of school design support, really um, the, the process of hearing from all the teachers uh, in the Montessori program um, and the leadership teams being able to work collectively together has been the most powerful part of the process for us. And um, the thought partnership, not just with principals, but with folks from downtown and, um, and our teachers has been uh, terrific for us. Uh, sometimes principaling feels like lonely work. And um, this has been a collaborative, um, strong lift that have lots of hands have made the work light. So we've been grateful to be a part of the process. The, the big um, academic thing that we're doing next year is that we're hiring a math teacher for middle school, which doesn't sound like a big deal, right? You would think that that was something that was already in place, um, but with the small number of students that I have, um, I had two allocations for middle school. So we have dual, um, we, we didn't, ha we have my language arts teacher has been teaching math and he's been doing an excellent job. Um, it's better consistent uh, 
teaching than we have had in the past, but now next year with our student-based allocation, we're going to be able to hire a fully licensed math teacher um, and we're going to be able to offer Algebra One to our eighth graders who are ready for that. Um, we're excited about it, our families are excited about it, and um, it wouldn't have been possible without the student-based allocation process. So. Any questions? Thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience that really puts a lot behind all the numbers and the reports. Sure. Commissioner Gore. You feel very comfortable now that you have the school-based funding to be able to do things like offer algebra and be more innovative and creative with your staff and students? We do. Um, it's been a, a year-long process and it, so what happens, what tends to happen is that we look at the data and we make decisions. Um, but this is, we spent a lot of time on the front end really figuring out what the root causes were in terms of challenges in our building. Um, and so I wouldn't have said in August that social and emotional learning was a big problem, a big challenge in our school. Um, but the, t the spending the time with the problems and looking at our data from diff with different lenses and asking other people to look at it with us really showed us that that was an issue. And so then it was about trying to figure out how can we, um, how can we change staff or change programming to meet the needs of those students. Um, not, you know, not just ask for another Midtown therapist, but we really need to do something um, across the whole school to address this need. Thank you both. There are no items for discussion or for action in unfinished business. The next section is section eight, which is new business. There are four items that we request that commissioners consider for action. The first is 8.01. This request for commissioners to approve a playground agreement for Madonna Elementary School and Center for Inquiry 4 at School 70 in partnership with Kaboom. We ask that commissioners consider this agreement for approval as presented. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agreement? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't ask for any discussion. Are there any comments for discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes. The next item is 8.02, is request for commissioners to approve sale of land parcel to Department of Public Works. We ask that commissioners consider resolution number 7744 for authorization of sale of parcel of land to Department of Public Works as presented. Do I have a motion to approve resolution 774 as presented? Second. All in favor, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. The next item is 8.03. We're requesting that commissioners approve authorization to submit a waiver from implementation of protected taxes. We request that commissioners approve resolution number 3006-17 as presented. Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 3006-17 as presented? So moved. In a second. Second. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Oh, <laughs> that was in favor, right? Okay. <laughs> Motion passes. The next item, 8.04, is a policy revision for consideration. Administration is requesting a revision to policy for reduction in force for classified employees, and your materials are the revised policies and the current policy for review. Also included materials are the associated administrative guidelines. We request that commissioners consider the proposed modification to the policy directing the superintendent to develop appropriate administrative guidelines for reduction in force for classified employees. Holland, this is a, um, we're not voting on this one, right? Yes, this will be 30 days. Any discussion on this item? Those are all the 
agenda items for new business. Does any commissioner wish to offer closing comments at this time? No, we've had a long meeting. Um, Commissioner I'd Gore? Like, I'd just like to thank uh, the people at, at Central Kitchen for taking us on the tour. Uh, commissioners and I were able to go and see how the food is prepared and what a great job they do for our students. And I visited Tech High School, their Elevate program, and it was very nice to see the school <coughs> operating and sharing different aspects of how our children could be successful. Mr. Arnold? I would just like to thank uh, the administration team for the reports. Uh, I'm just always blown away. We have such a great team and the information that we get and the evidence that we get that we're moving in the right direction from finances to career technology uh, to innovation schools. It's just very, very impressive and uh, kudos to the team. Yes, I'd like to also echo those comments and just thank all of our staff who um, we have some long meetings and we know they're on top of already long days and we appreciate all of your presence here. Um, I also want to thank um, all of our community for coming out to our first community meeting last night and um, look forward to more great input from our community regarding our um, facilities utilization um, process. So um, thanks very much. Fairby. In that same uh, a topic, just remind everyone that we have our next community meeting uh, on the task force report on facility utilization for our high schools. Uh, this coming Monday, May 1st, it will be the Ivy Tech Culinary Center on North Meridian Street. Again, we encourage as much participation as possible and just remind everyone that this is a very open and transparent process and we welcome uh, critical eye and comments as we consider these important decisions that need to be made regarding our high schools and utilization. <laughs> I also would, would like to close with a thank you to the uh, students and staff at uh, Short Ridge High School for allowing me to uh, take Principal Day's job for the day and serve as principal for a day uh, on uh, Friday, April 14th, had an opportunity to spend the day with students and staff and I'm just really excited about what I saw and uh, just really in, enthused and optimistic about what's happening not only there but the hard work of our students and staff across the district. So again, thank you. Thank you. Our next regular meeting will be our agenda review session on Tuesday, May 23rd at 6 p.m. in this room. Having completed all items on the agenda, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.